Hello folks, Lone Adventurer here. Welcome back to another part, part six, of my playthrough of Kernophalus into the Midnight Throne. Link to part one up in the corner of the screen. Link to Drive Through RPG, where you can grab yourself a copy down in the description below. I'm gonna get straight into it, assuming you've come from part five, so no waffle, let's just go. Our hero Antonio is in uh, this room down here. He seems to be getting quite close to the lair of the overseer. We're gonna go through this door into the next room. We need to check if the door is locked. So that is a roll of 12 or more on a d20. Three, so the door is not locked, but we still need to check to see whether it is trapped. And that is rolling a d10. A seven or more means it's trapped. Ah, seven. Okay, so the door does have a trap on it. Now we need to do a perception check to see whether we notice the trap. My perception score is 51. And we've rolled 58. So we have failed to see the trap. So we're gonna trigger the trap, and then we will have an opportunity to try and avoid it. So we're gonna roll D10 to see which trap we have set off. Four, a salvo of small poison darts strike the character. So let's try and dodge out of the way of this. My dodge skill is 20, so my chances are not high. E, we've rolled 11, so we have managed to dodge out of the way of the trap. And we can go through this door and into the next room. Before we go into the room, we're going to roll on the uh, lair die. So we're currently rolling D4. And if we roll a one or a two, then the next room will be the lair of the overseer. And we have rolled a one. So straight away at the beginning of this video, we're into the um, lair. I thought we'd have one or two more rooms, to be perfectly honest, but okay, no worries. What happens next? I don't know. All right, so in terms of the process we've got going on here, it's fairly straightforward. We have discovered the lair, so in a moment we will um, roll up to see what room shape we've got. We'll draw it onto the map, we'll mark it as the lair of the overseer. We don't need to engage it if we don't want to, we could keep exploring the rest of the domain but it feels like I should at the very least have a little bit of a go. I suppose we can always try and retreat if it is too terrifying. Let's mark it on and then we'll um, have a little read about the Overseer because I don't think we've read anything beyond just the description of it. 39 gives us this uh, little room here, I'll just draw that on. It's the same as room number six was. So there is the uh, room. I've just flipped the door from the bottom, the exit door from the bottom down over onto the left so that it doesn't go off the edge of the page. Mark it on the notes as the overseer room. And let's have a look how terrifying this overseer is. So the veil shifter is made of an ever-changing kaleidoscope of images that confound the senses. And this mastery over the illusory, illusory arts cast doubt upon the very fabric of truth. So it's an astral enemy. Combat skill of 40. Armor on all parts of the body. Health 12. What awful things is it doing to us? It's ruthlessness too and swift, so I'd have to remind myself what those things do. And you know what, I'm not going to read the actions. We're just going to try and fight it and see how it goes. And if that doesn't work, I'll run away and hopefully Antonio will survive to explore a bit more of the domain and strengthen himself up. But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit there. Let's find out what ruthlessness and swift means. Ruthlessness is an overseer only trait that grants the overseer a number of additional standard actions per round equal to the X value. That's absurd, isn't it? So it gets three actions 
for every attack that I do, it could potentially do three attacks. Already not feeling too confident. So that's ruthlessness and swift. The creature ignores all reaction negative modifiers. What's a reaction negative modifier? Not 100% sure, but we'll, we'll keep that in mind. And if we have a something that resembles a reaction negative modifier, hopefully we'll try and uh, remember that. Okay, let me get myself set up for combat. Right, let's do it. Let's have a little crack at the Veil Shifter. I don't think this is going to go too well. I think I need to boost this character up a little bit more before we're in a position to take the Veil Shifter on. But I think, probably, in order to finish this series, we need to have a little bit of a crack at it. So that's what we're going to do. Who's going to go first? Us or the Veil Shifter with three attacks? Let's find out. For the initiative roll, I am trying to roll under my perception. The target is trying to roll under their awareness. Oh, look at that. 70. Awareness of 70, the Veil Shifter. And my awareness is... Not my awareness, sorry, my perception. It's 51. So I'm trying to roll under 51. They're trying to roll under 70. Best of luck. I have advantage on perception checks, so I can use that if I need to. And I just remembered I didn't use my tracker... Uh, getting plus one cooking ingredient after a successful scavenge in the last video, but never mind. Getting distracted. The Veil Shifter has rolled 31. I have rolled 96. I could switch that to 69, but that's not going to help me. The Veil Shifter is going first, so the Veil Shifter is attacking. They've got three attacks because of this ruthlessness. So attack number one. I think I'm going to need possibly a little bit of paper to note down any effects that happen as a result of these attacks. Here we go. Attack number one. Five. Dreamscape shift. Magical. Veil shifter warps the battlefield into an illusory dreamscape, altering the terrain. All creatures in the area must succeed on an athletics check or fall prone. That's a disaster because my athletics check Athletics skill is low. I can at least have a go at resisting the uh, magical ability. My magic resistance is 20. 47, that failed. So then we can try and uh, uh, succeed at the athletics check. My athletics is 24. Fail, 66. So I'm going to fall prone. So a prone character must spend one standard action to get back up. Attacks against the prone character receive plus 30. That's ridiculous. So I'm not even going to get an action. So this Veil Shifter has got five actions before I get to attack them. Or more likely just attempt to run away. These guys are properly hardcore. Okay, so I'm just making a note that I'm prone at the moment. Although it seems unlikely I'm going to forget. Let's roll for the next action of the Veil Shifter. This is two of three in their go. This is their standard go. It's the same thing again. Well, I don't think you can be doubly prone, so I'm going to assume that means they dreamscape shift the battlefield, but uh, I'm already on the ground, so it doesn't really matter. And five, I'm going to reroll that. <laughs> Four, doppelganger surge. Veil Shifter summons illusory doppelgangers that mirror its ability. Two illusory doppelgangers appear near Veil Shifter and use its illusory mirage action immediately. These doppelgangers last until they've been struck once. So illusory mirage, Veil Shifter creates illusory duplicates of itself and its surroundings. It becomes heavily obscured and all attacks targeting it have disadvantage until the end of the next turn. So I guess I've got three opponents now. Do they all have ruthlessness? So is this now three veil shifters and each of them get three goes? I'm honestly a little bit confused as to how these actions interact with each other. 
So I've done this. I've created two doppelgangers. They, the doppelgangers uh, use the illusory mirage action. That means that all attacks targeting it have disadvantage until the end of the next turn. So I guess it just means that I've got disadvantage against the main one, and then they all get an action. I think I'm going to say that the main Veil Shifter gets the standard three actions, and then the two doppelgangers get just a one standard action each. Otherwise, otherwise this is going to spiral into something that I don't really know how to manage. Okay, well, the Veil Shifter has got a third action in this go. Reality Flux. Veil Shifter manipulates reality, calling, causing a torrent of illusions to clash upon a target, dealing 2d6 arcane damage. Right, so we can try and defend against that. We are prone, which means that the if it was a physical attack, it would be getting plus 30, I suppose. But it's not a physical attack, so we're just rolling to resist. 60, that is a fail. So we have failed to resist that. So we are taking 2d6 arcane damage. Wow, that is big. So the 4 gives us 1 point. The 6 gives us 2 point for a total of 3 points of damage. Taking us down to 14 toughness. And I think that is the end of the action of the Veil Shifter. Now the two Mirages did the Illusory Mirage, which gave me disadvantage on attacks targeting the Veil Shifter, but we would now be going into our action. Unfortunately for our action, all we're going to be doing is getting up off the ground so we are no longer prone, and that is the end of our action. And then we're going to go back into the enemy's action again. So let's see what the Veil Shifter is going to do. Mystic Gaze. Veil Shifter gazes at a target, causing it to perceive illusory, but very harmful threats. The target must succeed on a magic resistance check or suffer 4d4 arcane damage. It's just damage caused by magic effects, so there's no particular distinction to that kind of damage. Right, so we are trying to do the magic resistance check. 55. I mean, I know my magic resistance is low, but I'm not having much luck now. So 4d4 damage. So I'm going to have to roll this dice four times. I have got another 4d4 somewhere, but it's not on the table at the moment. Okay, here we go. We've rolled a 4, a 2, a 2 and a two. So that is four points of damage, taking me down to 10. Now I suppose at this point, the Veil Shifter's doppelgangers both get a go, because otherwise what would be the negative point of them being there? They've got to do something bad, otherwise uh, them being there doesn't really bother me. Okay, so doppelganger number one, five, my god, is it going to make me prone again and then I won't get an action? Because if I don't get an action, I can't even escape. So this is a magical effect, so we need to try and uh, resist. Okay, alright, a little bit of good luck there. We've rolled a 9, so we've managed to resist the dreamscape shift caused by the first doppelganger into the second doppelganger. 1. Illusory Mirage. Oh, so I can't resist this, it's just an effect that comes in and it means that my attacks targeting the Veil Shifter and presumably the doppelgangers in the next round will have disadvantage. So I guess we will have a go. I mean, this is a bad overseer for me to be facing because my magical resistance is super low and all of its attacks are magical. I'm guessing some of the other ones are more physical. Now, probably, if I were coming into this again better prepared, I should probably use my Hexmancer Mastery to start increasing the amount of damage. 
Oh, that's, oh, that's that's another thing I keep forgetting, isn't it? Yeah, I should have uh, done that. Start the combat. Opponent makes a magic resistance check, which means that they always get plus one cop damage. But I don't think I'm going to be doing 12 points of damage to this guy. That seems very unlikely. But let's do it anyway. So their magic resistance is 50. 64, so that is a fail. So that means I'm doing plus one damage whenever I do damage to the Veil Shifter. So I suppose I will attack one of the doppelgangers. That's what we're going to do. I think that's exactly the same as attacking the main uh, Veil Shifter. I am trying to roll under 61, and the Veil Shifter is trying to roll under 40. Or the Veil Shifter's doppelganger. Oh, they've rolled 41, which is above their combat skill. I've rolled 59, which is below my um, skill that I'm using, bladed weapons. So that means I have successfully hit it. All we're doing is rolling a paltry D6 to see damage. We need to roll D20 to see where we are hitting this thing. Actually, it doesn't really matter because... No, it doesn't matter at all, because when you strike a doppelganger they um the the uh it disappears so we don't need to roll for damage i don't think we have just successfully hit one of the doppelgangers so we are down to one doppelganger and it's back onto the veil shifter's turn veil shifter has three actions doppelganger will have one action let's see how it goes four doppelgangers really more doppelgangers. Okay, so we're going to roll for magic resistance. 30 is a fail. Yep, so we're now up to three doppelgangers. So that was the first action of the Veil Shifter. So we need to do the second action for the real Veil Shifter. Six, Mystic Gaze. Gazes at a target, causing uh, harmful threat illusions. So we need to make a magic resistance check. 44. So that is a fail. And magic resistance, unfortunately, you can't um, increase in the same way as you can your skills. So we're not going to be marking that. So 4d4 damage. A 3. A 2. A two and a two. So that's another four points of damage because each one of those uh, rolling between a two and a four does one point of damage. So we're taking four points of damage. So it's taking me down to six toughness. This is rubbish. And then one more action for the main veil shifter. One illusory mirage means we get disadvantage on attacks in the next go and then the doppelgangers have a go doppelganger number one dreamscape shift so this is potentially poor, falling prone again let's try and resist the magic attack 78 so that is a success which means we are prone again so we've fallen down subsequent action subsequent attacks will get plus 30 is that what prone was yeah, I guess it generally is, but they're not oh, so magical. I'm not really sure how any of these attacks would get plus 30. That sounds like something that's mainly for physical attacks, but prone still takes up one of your actions if you want to um, if you want to no longer be prone. Okay, so I'm prone again. Uh, doppelganger number two. Five, mystical shift. I'm already prone, doesn't matter. Six, mystic gaze. So we're going to try and resist. 70, that's a fail. So we're taking some damage. Why am I rolling so high with the D4? Usually I'm rolling ones every time. Right, that was another four points of damage. Jeez. Down to two. I think it's time to try and get out of here. How do I escape from this fight? I have legged it from a fight before. So fleeing. I think I can flee while I'm prone. Plus 30. I don't really know what the point of the veil shift of being able to make me prone is. Because none of the veil shifter's attacks 
involve doing a standard attack roll. They're all magical, which means that you just roll for defence. It's not a um, rolling a contested roll. It's not a contested roll. You're not rolling against the enemy. You're just rolling for yourself to resist the magic. So they're not rolling. So yeah, I don't really know how prone would uh, feed into that, but I'm, I'm not going to think about it for now. I just want to get out of this combat. When things aren't looking good and you want to disengage from combat and retreat to the previous room, you must make a successful dodge check. If you fail, it means your opponent is blocking you and you cannot leave the combat. Oh my god, a dodge check. 20. Is it at or below? It is at or below, isn't it? Ooh, that's a bit of a relief. That was tough, folks. I'm not going to lie to you. That was tough. I don't know if that's one of the trickier overseers or if they're all that hard. It's just that having three actions every go. All right, so Zephyrus Shadow gets an additional one action. Carnage Devourer gets an additional one action. Venom Cloud Siren gets an additional one action. Okay, so they all get one additional action. Gorehoof also gets two additional actions. But yeah, that is tough. Really, really tough. I don't know whether I managed those doppelgangers correctly, because that was a bit rough as well. No doubt Alex will pop up in the comments and uh, correct me on any bits and pieces that I didn't do uh, in line with the rules there. So, so make sure you check the comments for uh, Alex's thoughts. No doubt they will be down there soon. But yeah, that took me down to two toughness quite quickly. So I'm not sure how I would have stood a better chance at that because I didn't really even get a chance to hit it that many times. Now it does say near the start of the rules, you need to try and get your magic resistance up using items and things of that nature. So that might be one thing to try and get some items that give you magic resistance. Having a good dodge ability is important. I mean, I lucked out there. I wish I had more in dodge, but they're all important. All of the skills are important. So he retreats to the previous room, old Antonio. He's going to retreat to the previous room and then probably try and... Uh, uh, heal his wounds a little bit but I'll do that off camera before I carry on I think probably that room used up a light source seems like a minor point now but I'm gonna just put that on there so we're going back into room 11 and Antonio is leaning against the wall panting wondering what he just walked into there so maybe I tackled that overseer a little bit sooner than I should, thanks to my keenness to try and get it on camera, or maybe just uh, my approach has not been as performant as it could have been. This is a tough game, folks, but it is a good one. And actually now I'm pretty determined to heal up Antonio, do some more exploring in this level, I've got plenty of other doors that I can go through. And now that we have found the lair of the Overseer, this die over here resets. And rather than rolling for a lair check, we are now rolling for a domain exit die. Because you can find the exit to the domain and move on to a new domain, even without defeating the Overseer. So the benefits of defeating the Overseer, I think, is you get more XP for them, you get cool gear and treasure once you've uh, defeated them. So there is a real advantage to it, to tackling them, and also their um, Overseer influence, which I so frequently forget about anyway, ceases to have any impact on the domain so other enemies that you encounter in the domain would no longer have that benefit of doing plus two damage which i'm pretty sure i've forgotten a whole bunch of times 
But anyway, there you go. I think for the time being, I'm going to have to leave Ker Nathalis to one side because I want to cover some more games. I'm going to try and carry on playing it off camera if I can squeeze it in. I think for now, I'm going to move on to some other stuff. It's been really fun covering this game. It's given me an opportunity to really get to grips with a rule set that is significantly more involved and complex compared to other games that I've played. I know Alex T, the designer, considers this to be entry level in terms of his games, and that's fair enough. But I think for a lot of people, this one is going to be quite intimidating. But it's not a pushover, and that's kind of cool. I like that. I like that you're not going into this game thinking, oh, this is going to be a walk in the park. Those overseers, they're, they're a big deal. They're scary guys. And uh, that's fine. The fact that they are intimidating and possibly very, very difficult to defeat is absolutely fine. I'm okay with that. And there's lots of cool stuff in this book. There's a, there's a lot of depth here. There, there's a lot of game. There's a lot of stuff that I haven't even uh, glimpsed yet. Lots of enemies I haven't fought. Lots of treasure I haven't found. Lots of events that we haven't um, had happen to our character. It's just a lot of fun. I think it's pretty great. There you go. If you made it this far in this series, well done. Hopefully, uh, by the end of it, I wasn't making too many rules goofs. I think I made a few to start with, and certainly uh, some errors as I was playing. But that's just the way of it, folks. I make these videos not to give you an exhaustive, precise look at how to play these games. It's just so you can um, see me play them. And I hope you enjoyed watching me play this one. If you made it this far, you're probably already a subscriber. But uh, drop a comment below. Let me know if you've been playing this. I'm especially interested in whether you have defeated an overseer, what you think gave you the advantage and allowed you to defeat that particular overseer, and maybe um, you know what masteries you've got. Uh, and whether you think you made a good choice with your masteries, whether they help you in combat, drop me some comments. Let's have a chat about it. That was Kernafarless. Thank you very much for joining me on this adventure, and I hope to see you for another one soon. Bye for now.